Good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to the NTI Opal Star Centre. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you. Good morning. Very pleased to see you all this morning. Very pleased to see the classroom so full. Okay, so today we are going to be doing one of the mandatory units, which is safe isolation. Now, you might be thinking, well, I don't install isolations, why am I here? I think it's very important that everybody understands isolation methodology. You could be working in a multidiscipline team, and it's good for everybody to know that the isolations have been installed correctly. Okay? Any questions before we begin? No, thank you. No? Okay, let's begin then. Okay, so I'm Matthew, very pleased to meet you. We're not expecting a fire alarm today. If one should happen, then I'll be with you at all time and I'll take you out to the muscle point. Okay, the objectives today and the aims. Uh, we're going to have a little bit about the regulatory requirements. A little bit about hazard identification different types of isolation methods and isolation methodology. We're going to be looking at selection and planning of the isolations, installation of the isolations, draining, venting, purging and flushing, carrying out the work activity, and then the reinstatement of the equipment. Okay, now this um, legislation, this program has been developed in line with the best practice document called HSG 253, um, it was put together by the Energy Institute and the UK HSE. And this is the governing body that takes after all, looks after all the assets in the North Sea, and this is best practice isolation. Okay, so why do we need to isolate then? Why do we need to isolate? Frank? To make it safe. To make it safe. What we're trying to isolate is the hazardous energies. Now. It could be, when you're isolating something, there could be multiple hazardous energies and it's not always easy to identify all the hazardous energies. For example, let's just take a control valve. Let's, su let's suggest I've arrived on the station this morning and we're going to remove and replace a control valve. What are the hazardous energies? Ian? Compressed air. Compressed air, brilliant. Many people forget about the compressed air. Compressed air can be as little as four bars, it's very dangerous. If we put it near any orifice in our body, it can cause us damage. We put it near the eyes, it can blow our eyes out of the sockets. If we put it near our ears, it can cause an embolism. Near our navel, it can rupture our intestines. Um, it's very dangerous, we should never play with it, never use horseplay, never clean ourselves down with it. And we should always make sure we isolate the compressed air. Good, what else? Control valve, what else is there? That's right, low voltage DC, well done. Low voltage DC, what is it with a control valve? 24 volts, what's the danger of that? It's low voltage, why is it dangerous, Ian? It can electrocute you. Um, it might not electrocute you, but DC in particular is more susceptible to create a spark. We get a phenomenon called DC arcing. That's why they use AC on aircraft, because it's less likely to create an ignition source. We are all working in explosive atmospheres, so it's very important we isolate the low voltage DC. What else? That's two. Come on. Guys, what are the two main things that are going to kill us or injure us if we remove a control valve? We've thought about two. Yes, anybody? Pressure. Well done. Well done, Ian. The first two things that's going to injure us when we break into a line is pressure and product. In our case, it's hydrocarbons, okay? If your supervisor says to you that line is drained down, purged, isolated, is it safe? No. No. Find out for yourself. Always think full pressure, full product. Whenever we break into a line, we should practice safe breaking. Work on the furthest ones away from us open that flange gradually, make sure both sides of that line are, are moving independently and then we know all the pressure and product has gone, okay? So, we're talking about a control valve. Already, my point is, it's not immediately, immediately obvious what the hazardous energies are. We've got compressed air, low voltage DC, pressure, product, there could be gas, 
even the weight of the object, the control valve could be very big. Gravity, that is another hazardous energy. Okay? Now, the danger is, when we do a task every day, all the time and repeat it, if we do the same task every week, we become complacent. Best practice is, we should take the latest P&ID, go out to the equipment, walk the line and make sure the P&ID reflects plant conditions. Very important. Um, the process industry is 24 hours. It could be we're all on vacation, we've had two weeks in the Shangri-La swimming with our speedos on. We come back and the contractors have installed another line. Okay? We should always go out, identify the hazards before we do anything or write any document for the task. Okay, good. Now, so, why do we isolate? We isolate when we carry out any of these tasks, so repairs, maintenance, inspection, confined space, commissioning, decommissioning, plant mods, all these activities. Confined space in particular, we have to um, carry out extra, take extra cautions. What we should do, we should apply the skipping rope principle. So if we have a vessel, if we have a vessel like this, it should be that in theory, you should be able to skip around the vessel. We should always break the lines and minimize the potential for the hazardous energies being reintroduced while somebody is working inside. Okay? Now, hazardous energies. It could be rotating equipment, pumps, fans, conveyors, diesel engines, compressors, anything that rotates is a hazardous energy. Pressure or steam, very dangerous hazardous energy. Uh, hazardous materials, that would be chemical injection, corrosion inhibitors, demulsifiers, all that kind of thing. Gravity and stored energy. Anything that uses or carries electricity, uh, we've already mentioned low voltage DC and we'll get high voltage AC, which is incredibly dangerous, isn't it? Now, this is the process that the Health and Safety Executive and the Energy Institute say we should follow before we isolate anything, and this is the process. Now, many people say we write the risk assessment first. If we ask people what's the first step, we write the risk assessment, we don't. We always get out in the field, identify the hazardous energies first because something could have changed and it's easy to miss something and become complacent, okay? Now, so we follow this procedure all the way down. I kind of think for heavy oil, this is kind of these won't change around because I think normally you would flush and purge a heavy oil before you install the isolations. This one, very, very important. We always test the effectiveness of the isolation just before the work commences. In process, it could be we've isolated something three days before. If that valve is passing, that line is back up to full pressure and full product in a very short space of time. Always think full pressure, full product, find out for yourself. Even if the pressure gauge is on zero, does that mean it's safe? No. No. The pressure gauge could be faulty, couldn't it? Okay. Um, in process, we use a lot of gate valves. Rising stem gate valves, by their very nature, they nearly always leak. We use them for controlling flow, and we shouldn't. A gate valve should be fully open or fully closed. If we use it for controlling flow, the gate rattles in the process, it wears out the valve body, and the next time we isolate, it will pass. Okay? Always check the isolations before the work commences. Okay. So, hazard identification. We've talked a little bit about steam, the effects of that are obvious. Uh, high temperature, high pressure, it can burn our skin. If we cover our body in burns uh, past a certain percentage, we'll nearly always die. There's no treatment for that. Compressed air. Again, if we put that through any part of our body, any orifice, cut or wound, it can cause extreme damage. Even in pressures as low as 4 bar that we use for controlling control valves. Uh, years ago, I'm sure you'll remember this, Frank, in workshops, 
We used to blow ourselves off every day, every night with the air gun to get rid of all the dirt off our body. It's very dangerous, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't ever do horseplay with it either. Always treat it with respect, always isolate the compressed air. Okay, high pressures. So, um, we have high pressure oil, uh, we could have high pressure gas. Being um, high pressure oil is the worst thing to come across. If you see a leak, especially on small bore tubing, that line can be 600 bar. What we should do is drain it, purge it, isolate it, and then go to repair it. We should never put our hand near high pressure oil. We can get something called high pressure injection. Oil is the worst thing to get into your bloodstream. Often, if you're lucky, and you get immediate medical attention, often the only course of action is to amputate because it causes gangrene and blood poisoning very, very quickly. Now, if you look at this guy here, he put his hand, that's the point of entry, by high pressure oil. This is what they had to do to fix him. They had to remove his veins, and this guy was lucky. High pressure injection. The velocity, if a line is 600 bar, the velocity of that oil can be faster than a rifle bullet. It's incredibly dangerous. There is no PPE that will protect you from that. Okay? Any questions, guys? No. No? no. Okay, good. Now, toxic substances. Again, this is going to be corrosion inhibitors, uh, demulsifiers, all of that kind of thing. Some of these chemicals are incredibly dangerous. Treat them with respect. What we should have is an MSDS sheet with every chemical and it will tell us the PPE to use and the precautions that we should take and the immediate action if we are to ingest it or get it on our skin. What PPE should we wear for chemicals, Ian? Uh, something gloves. Yeah. Goggles. Breathing apparatus. Okay. Boots. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Now, what you need to remember is one set of PPE doesn't fit every chemical. On the gloves, often there is a number and it will tell you the burn through time of various chemicals. Your job is to look at the MSDS sheet and wear the correct PPE. Remember, one set of PPE doesn't fit every chemical. Okay? Now, nitrogen. We use nitrogen a lot in process. We use it for purging, we use it for blanketing. Uh, why is nitrogen dangerous then? It takes the air away. It's an asphyxiant, okay? I think with nitrogen, a lot of people think, well, it's inert, it doesn't aid combustion. And I think subconsciously we think it's safe. The air that we breathe is 70 something percent nitrogen. But if we breathe pure nitrogen, we will be dead very quickly, okay? Two or three breaths, dead. Now, the danger is, if you've got a process vessel with a permanent nitrogen connection, that must be isolated too. Lots of people forget to isolate the nitrogen supply, okay? Electricity, um, this is a graph of electrical fatalities in the UK. I'm not sure what happened in 2000, okay? Uh, we've got blue at work and red non-work. We know the dangers of high voltage AC. It causes burns to our body. It effectively stops our heart from beating and causes ventricular defibrillation. It effectively gives us a heart attack or extreme burns, doesn't it? It's very important we treat it with respect. We can't see it, we need to make sure it's isolated properly. Low voltage DC, again, DC causes something called DC arcing. It's an ignition source. We're working in an explosive environment. We must always treat the low voltage DC with respect and make sure it is isolated correctly. What we should do to eliminate that hazardous energy is test for dead. Okay, so electricity, testing for dead. This is what we should do. The electrician, he should test his testing unit is working on the proving unit. He should then check across each phase and to earth. I'm not an electrician, so excuse me, guys. Then, what he should do, he should go out in the field 
and test for them on the pump. Best practice if the guys are removing the pump, he should take back each one of them phases to the shield. So if somebody does inadvertently reintroduce the power, it will blow the fuse. You must make sure the electrician goes out in the field and tests for dead. He might have isolated the wrong piece of equipment. There's been many accidents happened with that over the years. Make sure he tests for dead in the field. Okay, rotating equipment. So that is your pumps, your fans, compressors, diesel engines, anything that rotates that can cause entanglement. Now look at this guy. I think this is in South America or something like that. This is a calciner. This is used for drying a powder like cement. This guy was sitting here, thought the equipment was isolated, and he was dragged in. Awful, isn't it? Look at his legs. Now, if you look at this chain, the driving mechanism, to release him, that chain has got to be driven that way. What's going to happen here? Crush his legs. Probably amputate them, I think. My friend, he was a paramedic, he looked at this. He said, Often, when you went to people who had had a car accident that was trapped, talking perfectly fine and everything, as soon as you released them, they died. They said that would probably happen to this guy as well, toxic shock. After a long period of having your limbs trapped, um, when it is released, you get toxins in you and it causes your heart to stop beating. Um, yeah, so obviously a terrible situation. Some guys have said, don't worry, this guy made a full recovery and he's now playing for the Omani national football team. Okay? I'm joking by the way. Okay, so what we do is we identify the hazardous energies, okay? Then we write the risk assessment and reduce the risk to as low as reasonably practicable. And we do that with isolations. So there are three types of isolation methodology. That is positive isolation, that is the highest positive isolation. Now Positive isolation is a separation of the line and fitting a flange or we fit a blind or a spade. Blind and a spade are the same thing. Okay? We never leave any line open in process. We always fit the appropriate anti-flange um, to that pipe. We never leave anything open and we always talk it up with full flange integrity procedures. So, positive isolation. Separation of the line, fitting flanges, or fit a blind or a spade. Okay? That is the highest form of isolation. The type of isolation we use depends on the hazardous energy. If we've got 30,000 litres of oil, then we want a positive isolation. If we've got 50 litres of water, then we might do a different isolation. It depends on the hazardous energy that we're trying to isolate. So, the next best thing, next best thing is a proven isolation. This is a double block and bleed, okay? Now, we can prove this valve is not passing by opening the bleed. Remember what I said at the beginning? Gate valves nearly always pass, okay? This process could be back up to full product and full pressure in a very short space of time. So, we open the bleed and we can prove this valve is holding its integrity with the caveat that this bleed can become blocked. Okay? If we're working with heavy oils, it's possible this bleed can become blocked. What the operators do in the UK that I've worked with, they carry a welding rod in the pocket, they'll open the bleed and they'll shove the welding rod up the bleed, okay? That's good operation, but it's not really the correct thing to do, is it, from a safety point of view. What you should do is you should, should install a pressure gauge, you should inject nitrogen, watch that gauge move. Once you've done that, you know that bleed is open. Remember, there's a possibility that that bleed can become blocked. So, double block and bleed, or a single block and bleed, which would be this, we can prove that valve is not passing by opening the bleed. Okay? Any questions? So, got positive isolation, separation of the line, fitting a flange, or fit a spade or a blind. 
got proven isolation, the next one down, double block and bleed, single block and bleed. Now, the next one, I'll go back to this in a second guys, next one, the lowest form of isolation is non-proven isolation and that would be just one valve closed. There is no way of proving whether that valve is passing or not. It might be two valves closed. It could be ten valves, all in a line, all closed. That would be the lowest form of isolation and very dangerous. There is no way of proving that them valves are not passing or not. So, positive isolation, separation of the line, fit a plunge, okay? Proven isolation, double block and bleed, single block and bleed, non-proven, single valve and multi-valve, okay? Now, any questions? No? Okay. Now, gate valves are not very good for isolation, only when they're new. The best valves for isolation purposes are ball valves, plug valves and needle valves. Okay? Now, it must be, the valve should be capable of being locked in the closed position. This is very important. Many people remove valve handles to isolate. That is a very bad practice. A lot of process guys, they keep an adjustable in the pocket. It is easy to reintroduce that hazardous energy. Also, with the old type of ball valves, it's possible to put the handle back on 90 degrees out. You can make that mistake. The new ones, it's not possible as a key way. A valve should have a proper isolation device. You should use the best isolation device you've got in your arsenal to prevent somebody inadvertently reintroducing that hazardous energy. Never remove a valve handle. Okay? Any questions, guys? No. Mohammed? No, thank you. No? Okay, good. Okay, so positive, proven, non-proven isolation. Non-proven isolation, the lowest form of isolation, should only be used on non-life equipment, and that would be during shutdown, that kind of thing. Okay? So, what we should do is we should walk the line, ensure the PID reflects plant condition, and make sure we use the most suitable isolation methodology for the hazardous energy we are trying to isolate. Okay? Now we should never use emergency stop buttons or uh, switches as isolation devices. All electrical isolation should be isolated properly. I'm now I'm going to give you some examples of isolation devices. That would be, they call this in the UK a pizza box or a cheese box. Some people call it a baby bell. Okay? This is designed to go around the wheel of a gate valve and the hole in the middle is for the stem, rising stem gate valve. This enables the valve to be locked in an open or a closed position. Multi-locks or pro-locks, wire locks, these are quite good for valves. Multi-locks, um, during a shutdown, every guy, every tradesperson would put their own lock on here and the permit to work authoriser would put theirs on as well. Once all the tradespeople have been taken off the permit, the permit to work authoriser will um, withdraw his last. Okay? Panel locks, multi-locks, more electrical panel locks. Now, panel blind. This one, vented blind. It's not a very good picture, but this is a homemade vented blind. If you can see the hole in the middle, that hole does not go all the way through. That goes up and exits to that gate valve. We've got a better picture on the next one. Here, the valve, the hole, sorry, goes through the blind and exits here. This enables us to fit a ball valve. And what that does, if you imagine, what kind of isolation is that here? Is it positive, proven, or non-proven? Non-proven. Non-proven. If we get a vented blind, what that enables us to do, we can insert that there, and that becomes our bleed. So it changes a non-proven isolation into a proven isolation. It's a very useful device for de-isolating and keeping
keeping the process safe. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Yes. Yes? Good. Okay. Excellent. Now, flange blanks, remember, we never leave any line open. We always fit the most the correct flange blank to an open process line. We never leave anything open. Vented flange blank, this is another homemade one, so a guy's drilled this and he's fitting a socket, that will enable us to fit a bleed here as well. It's another way of fitting a bleed. Non-proven, changing it to proven. Okay, tags. This is um, we should do a tag out and lock out so we fit the isolation device with the tag. We never rely on a tag alone. That is not a legal isolation. Okay? Always used in conjunction with. Drain down point, we can isolate those, we should mark those. We should always mark which valves should be locked open and locked closed. We should isolate pneumatic isolations. Remember the dangers of four bar compressed air. And we should record all this information on the isolation certificate. And that would be the task, the location, P and ID number, valve number, isolation points, isolation methodology, is it positive, proven, non-proven, etc. Remember, guys, we should always test valves before we start work. And remember, bleed and drain valves can become blocked. Thank you very much.